everybody. My name is Tyler Ryan, student at Western Connecticut State University. And so the other day on December 10th, I gave a presentation in my inorganic chemistry course on organometallic anti-cancer drugs. So during my research, I found that there are some helpful videos on the topic, but there isn't really any video that goes in depth onto the whole subject in itself. So I'd like to record myself giving this presentation and upload it to YouTube for others to watch and, um, We'll have other videos linked, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact me through the comments or through message. So let's get started. So basically, I've chosen this topic because as members of society and as humans in general, everybody watching this or listening has probably been affected by cancer in some way, shape, or form, whether directly or through a family member or friend or animal even. Cancer affects all of us. And a lot of times, it's people don't like to talk about it. It's a soft sub soft subject and um but as scientists and chemists even it's important that we do talk about it because there is a lot that the average chemist does know and will be able to help contribute to this so first we're going to look at some different compound classes of organometallic cancer drugs so let me first start by saying organometallic there will be a metal involved and usually some organic component so we're going to be strictly speaking of those drugs only. So we'll look at some platinum complexes, metallocenes, metal arenes, metal carbonyls, and metal carbenes. So the first drug we're going to look at, not necessarily organometallic because there are no organic components here, but nonetheless still a very important metallic anti-cancer drug, and that is cisplatin. You'll notice we have this platinum group that is a square planar complex with two chloro groups and two amine groups. So first, a little bit of history. It was synthesized by Michael Peyron in 1845, so almost 170 years ago. Its structure was then first determined by Alfred Werner, the famous inorganic chemist, in 1893. It wasn't until it was reported in Nature in 1965 that it was effective in treating tumors in uh, lab mice. So then more research being done in the 1960s concluded with clinical trials beginning in 1971, ultimately with FDA approval in 1978. And today, as far as cisplatin is concerned, there is still research being done on further derivatives to um, help combat issues of um, side effects. So we'll take a look at that in a little bit. But first, um, let's take a look at the synthesis of cisplatin. So as an inorganic chemist, it's actually a pretty straightforward molecule to determine how to synthesize. If you know your trans effect series, you would assume, okay, we could start with um, this tetrachloroplatinum group here. From there, we'll substitute all those chlorine groups to iodine groups because those are more reactive. Now here, with two equivalents of ammonia, we'll be able to produce this cis-ammonia group here. So we'll have two ammonia groups in the cis configuration. And then using some silver nitrate, we'll be able to replace those iodine groups here with some water molecules. And from there, with excess potassium chloride, we'll be able to produce this cisplatin, which is the platinum complex with two chlorines and two ammonias in the cis conformation. So if we look at the mechanism of action of cisplatin, um, there's actually a good video that I will link in the description or annotation here. And it actually does a nice visual representation of how cisplatin actually works. But as you'll notice here, there's a lot of biochemical signaling that does take place. And I'm not going to be focusing entirely on that, but more of the inorganic chemistry and looking at how these DNA addicts are formed and how that ultimately leads to apoptosis, also known as pre-programmed cell death. So if we take a look at this, the main reaction, the main chemistry that's going on here is this equation and adduct formation reactions. So we'll see here that first we have our cisplatin group, once in the body, reacts with water to displace one of these chlorine ligands with a now a water molecule, and ultimately forming a strong electrophile cation species. This species will react with the nitrogen at a in one of the guanine base pairs in cancer encoding DNA. So from here, this reaction now forms a platinum nitrogen bond in guanine. So not pictured here, this reaction will repeat, will form this plat this platinum complex again, 
but instead of this water molecule, it's attached to this nitrogen, and it will form now another strong electrophile, which will form another bond to guanine at the seventh nitrogen in the guanine molecule in the DNA. So what happens here now, we have this platinum bonded to two nitrogens in DNA and also two excess nitrogens here from the ammonia groups. Now, um, these bonds are very strong and we'll see how that becomes important because now the DNA is effectively inhibited. Um, this causes a large kink in the major groove of the DNA here, ultimately with bending up to about 40 degrees in the DNA structure. Um, so since these bonds are so strong, it actually makes it hard for damage and uh, repair proteins and enzymes to remove this. So ultimately, we do have two types of options. We could either repair the, the DNA by removing the cisplatin, or we won't be able to repair it and we won't be able to remove cisplatin. So through a lot of complex biochemistry that will not be included here, um, essentially damage repair would mean that signals are sent for the correct proteins and enzymes to come and remove cisplatin, ultimately leaving the cancer encoding DNA unharmed. Or what we are hoping for in effectively treating cancer is that the repair is blocked, which would call for repair proteins not working, which will then signal for cell death. So another molecule in the cisplatin family is carboplatin, which is marketed as paraplatin, which is very similar to cisplatin, except you'll notice instead of two chloral groups, we have this dicarboxylate group. And what this dicarboxylate group does is essentially it weakens the ability of the molecule in general. So it forms weaker DNA adducts, which means it needs more of a uh, more higher dosage which is about four times the dosage of cisplatin for the same effects. But because of this, we can lessen the dosage and ultimately leading to less side effects, less severe nausea, vomiting, um, and uh, similar symptoms to that. It's also believed that there's an alternate mechanism that it activates by with bioactivation. So it's actually believed that this might, it might work in this manner through some alternate biochemical signaling versus the DNA um, inhibition. So next we're going to look at metallocenes. Now metallocenes are metal complexes where a metal has two pi bonded cyclopentadienyl ions. So the cyclopentadienyl ion being this five membered ring here with the metal sandwiched in between most commonly with these metals here also we can have these square planar compounds where we have the two cyclopentadienyl rings but we could also have excess ligands coming off. So the first molecule we'll be taking a look at is ferrocene and is the simplest metallocene. It's most commonly prepared by students in inorganic chemistry laboratories and has many applications. However it was first accidentally prepared by Peter Poisson in 1951. He initially believed that this iron atom coordinated linearly to these two rings and actually bridged them together. However, it was proven by Robert Woodard and Jeffrey Wilkinson in 1952 that this iron was actually sandwiched between the two rings. This being the first compound of its kind is generally credited with the birth of organometallic chemistry, and from then, research had boomed with metallic and carbon-based research. So many derivatives of ferrocene and metallocenes in general have anti-proliferative properties. First, we'll be looking at tamoxifen and ferrocifen. Tamoxifen, known as an estrogen inhibitor to help stop breast cancer, is seen here with this, this structure. But the only difference between that and ferrocene is this benzene ring. In ferrocifen, this benzene ring here is replaced with ferrocene itself. So research has shown that the way tamoxifen works is it's a competitive antagonist that binds to estrogen receptors but does not activate them. So preventing the release of estrogen will actually halt breast cancer growth because it does require plenty of estrogen. So ferrocifen with a similar structure, what makes it special and how does it actually work? Well, the research on ferrocifen, the team that's been developing and working with this, has called ferrocifen a redox antenna. 
So what happens is this iron two atom here will actually lose an electron becoming oxidized to iron plus three. Through resonance, an electron is moved from this hydroxyl group down to this iron, bringing it back down to iron two, leaving this oxygen radical here. Next, with the loss of hydrogen, we purely have an oxygen radical, which will then lose that electron and the hydrogen atom here, causing this structure here. So this structure here is known as the quinone methide, which, if you'll notice, is primed for nucleophilic attack at several locations in the molecule, making it very reactive. But what's the big deal here? Here I have just an image showing you tamoxifen inhibiting um, a protein here, but what is the big deal really? Ferrocephine has this added redox activity, and it's known that metallocene redox activity is far greater than any organic molecule's redox activity, which, as many of you know, redox activity is key to biological activity. So if you know your biochemistry, you'll know that the, the human body and all life is essentially nothing more than redox potentials and electrochemical gradients. So this, the research has shown that this ferrocephin added redox activity promotes cytotoxicity as a result of this redox and susceptibility to nucleophilic attack. So briefly, let's take a look at some other organometallics. Here we have titanocene Y, which is known to um, activate the immune system, which is great with many cancer patients having suppressed immune system activation. It also is known to induce apoptosis, both of which are great characteristics for an anti-cancer drug. I also see ruthenium arenes, which are these ruthenium half sandwich compounds. We know that they do not target DNA, but instead target specific proteins and enzyme adducts. However, the specific mechanism of activation is unknown. As mentioned before, we have metal carbonyls, which are just a class of metal complexes that specifically just have carbonyls coordinated to them. So here we have some here. Um, it's a very bold category with, I shouldn't say bold, I rather broad category where the properties of these molecules aren't easily grouped together. Interestingly, we have this diarene ruthenium with a ferrocene bridge molecule here. So we have this diarene ruthenium and it's bridged by a ferrocene molecule. And this is shown to be cytotoxic for cisplatin resistant cancers, which means effectively that it doesn't follow the same mechanism that, that cisplatin does. So, also, we see an increase in the redox potential, which only helps assert that it is effective in cytotoxicity. In conclusion, inorganic chemistry is everywhere and is crucial to our lives. The special reactivity of these metal-containing complexes is truly something special and is important for all chemists to understand. It's imperative and essential. So by furthering our understanding of inorganic chemistry as a field in broad in these reactivities of these metal complexes, we can definitely help change the world and effectively change the way this disease, this terrible disease, does affect our lives.